Yes, uh, I go to um, actually South Glens Falls High School. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm actually uh, a junior there. I'm taking a politics course, and uh, one of our projects is to come to one of these events, and you know. So are you taking pictures and stuff? Huh? Taking pictures? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I offered to bring you guys some voter registration forms, and they acted kind of odd. But I have them in my car. Oh, okay. Well, I'm 17. I can't register to vote. Right, but what about the other people? I can check with them. Right, because I went over to Bluebird. Remember they acted like, well, why would you do that? Like, duh. Because there's a whole bunch of people going to be ready to vote. That's why. So, I don't know. If I gave them to you, or would it matter? I don't have to give them to you, I guess. Unless you want some. Um, I can spread the message. When will you be 18? Not till next year. Yeah, next year. Ooh. <laughs> I could give you some. I could go get my. Where will you be? Just somewhere here? Uh, I'll probably sit here. It's probably where I get the best view. Right. Actually, you could even get some from that lady there. I'm sure at the desk. But I have maybe 85 more in my car. Okay. I had 400. You can put. I had a lot, but I got rid of them. So well, good luck. What do you think? Of, what do you think of politics right now? It's pretty interesting. That's pretty strange. I've never, I've never seen it like this in my whole life. Where are we going? <laughs> so, anyway, 
Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. What's your last name? Uh, Thick. Thick. T H I C K. My son would have gone to South High, except that we had to move temporarily, so he went down to Albany. But he went to Oliver Winch. And I have lots of South High graduates that live in my building. That's one of those things. Anyway, you're probably one of the gifted kids or something, right? I like to think so. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> to be more, to be more say, would you say that kids are more? Well, you would know if they were more politically active were more politically interested than they were 10 years ago because you weren't here 10 years ago. Yeah. But what do you think? Do you think kids are into politics? I'd say that, the, if anything, the 2016 election really got people into politics, I'd say, at least in my school. Awesome. Because I almost feel like standing right up, right outside on, what is that, Merritt Street with a big sign. I think so. Get your voter with your parts here. But do they have them in the, in the front office or something? Not that Wait, I know of. Where do you get them? I thought that, like, in participation in government class, we gave it to you? No? Um, we briefly mentioned it. I assume at, like, the end of the year and stuff, since the seniors will be 18, most of them by then will hand them out. Right, but you have to be registered to vote a certain amount of time before the election. That's, that's the, like, maybe the end of, I hope it's not this month. I'll go ask that lady. Okay. All right? So, whatever. We'll be back. registered, I think, 35 days before, so some kids might be able to vote in the primary. Okay. And you have, you have to do that soon. Otherwise, it's 35 days before the November election for the kids that graduate that aren't going to be 18 now. But um, they told me that if you are going to be 18 at the time of the election, you can register in advance. Okay. So here we can have that. It's somewhere on there. And then how to donate your organs and stuff, too. Well, thank you. Well, you're welcome. Okay, and I gotta wander around today. What's your name again? Cecilia. Cecilia? Yeah. Nice to meet you, Cecilia. Yeah, nice to meet you too. Yes. So I'm gonna go well. <clears throat>
choose me. I'm like, going in and out.
handouts. Hi, thank you, sir. <laughs> You're welcome. This is a school. Oh, you know, wouldn't that be lovely? Thank you. You're much so much smarter than I am. You should be doing this. <laughs> Oh, no, I
testing, testing. All right, here we go. Welcome. My name is Stephen Dana. I'm the dean of the SUNY Plattsburgh at Queensbury Branch Campus. In case you didn't know, SUNY Plattsburgh has a Queensbury campus right next door. But you are in the beautiful Northwest Bay Conference Center that SUNY Adirondack builds in addition to some other spectacular facilities. We have an outstanding community college and an outstanding partnership with SUNY Plattsburgh at Queensbury and SUNY Adirondack. So knowledge is power. That's what Francis Bacon said. And tonight, you have a chance to leave empowered to choose the next 21st Congressional District candidate who will serve our region. The stakes are high. You're here because you care about the environment. You're here because you're concerned about climate change. Perhaps you're here for your grandchildren or for future generations. Regardless, this is an important evening. And it is sponsored by North Country Climate Reality. And you had on your seats, and I hope you've tucked it in your pockets, a little square flyer that describes North Country Climate Reality. NCCR was founded five years ago to support individual and community climate solutions. We meet bi-monthly, 5 to 8 p.m. with food, <laughs> right next door, and we strategize and brainstorm and converse about solutions, hope. This is the outcome of one of those sessions. Julie Walsh and Dana Stimson. Where's Julie and Dana? Please stand up. All right, Julie. Let's give them a big hand. <laughs> At one of our meetings, said, "You know, Steve, we we should have a, a, a meet the candidates environmental forum." And that was four months ago. And here we are today. And then we needed a moderator. We needed someone who had the savvy and, and, and everything it took to moderate a panel of distinguished guests. And that's where Dr. Bill Troop comes in. Bill, right here. <laughs> I'll take a look at Bill. <laughs> but before I do so, I also want to recognize our committee, the NCCR committee, if you will. Assistant to the Dean, Michelle Howland. <laughs> We also know Michelle as singer of Juxtapose, the beautiful environmental songs that they sing at our annual conferences, and also the songs they sing at their different places they sing at in the region. Also, a, a former member, founding member, Patrick Nelson, who happens to be right there. A <laughs> new member, Dr. Linda Fusco, right there in the back. There we go. And of course, Bill Truth. So I'm going to tell you about Bill and then I'm going to stop. So Bill is Professor of Environmental Studies at Green Mountain College. He was a provost there for 12 years and he still has all his hair. I don't know how he did it, but he was a provost and then he returned to the faculty. He served for six years on the board of directors of the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. He is involved in too many environmental projects to list right now. He is working on a book, though, titled Flourishing Amid the Age of Climate Change, Finding the Heart of Sustainability. And personally, one of the things I love about Bill is that he's filled with hope, and he inspires and he moves cynicism out of the picture because there are solutions. So with that, let's go. Thank you. I think we're going to hear about hope tonight and solutions. So uh, I'm going to be very brief because these are the folks you want to hear from. But I want to first thank you all for coming out to this. It's clear that environmental issues matter a great deal in the North Country. And I want to thank you for all of the questions you've submitted. We've done our very best to them, put them together so that the candidates have an opportunity to address them. They won't get to all of them, of course. 
I also want to have a big thank you for our candidates for having the courage and stamina to run for office. We need more people. So we've designed this forum to maximize the candidates' opportunity to share their perspectives on key environmental issues in short statements and to comment on the views of each other as they choose. So here's the format. It's a little complicated, but not too complicated. <laughs> They're going to get it. Um, first, they each have a two-minute opportunity to introduce themselves not necessarily about the environment, just their candidacy. Then, we'll have pairs of questions and follow-ups on particular topics regarding environmental issues. And on the first question, the primary question, each candidate will have up to two minutes to respond to the question. They also will have the option to pass or to briefly agree with someone else, and then to bank their time for the follow-up question. And, uh, and in the follow-up round, they'll either have a 30-second sound bite, 30 seconds, or if they bank their time, they'll have 80 seconds. So you, know, you, can, you can say, I think I'm going to wait to deliver my powerful response on the follow-up round. Uh, they can also pass on the follow-up. So we've asked the candidates to be position-focused with their answers and to express disagreements with respect. Now, the order of responses is going to be, comes from a random number generator, uh, but it's been adjusted to make sure each candidate gets a good shot at first or second uh, responses. And we've really tried to make this as fair as we possibly can. We're going to have a new topic and pairs of questions, and we're going to go till 8. Uh, the hardest job in this forum <laughs> is keeping time. <laughs> and uh, we have a great timekeeper. I want to thank Don Franks, who will keep track of the candidates' time. Don? <laughs> And with a red card, when time is up, and when time is up, I will have to politely but firmly cut people off. And so we're prepared for everyone. Okay, we're not going to take questions from the audience. We've got your questions. We're going to do our best to put them in, and we're going to end as close to eight as we can. So with that, it's time to hear from our candidates. And the introductions go in alphabetical order, starting with them. Well, first off, I want you guys to all give yourselves a round of applause, please, because environmental issues cannot be deprioritized any longer. There's so much going on in the world. There's so many things. We cannot forget about these issues. So give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> Don Boyage, and I live in Cambridge in Washington County, and I'm an environmental attorney in upstate New York. And it's really interesting coming off of Earth Day, and I want to call upon all the candidates, all of our electeds in Albany and D.C. to remember that Earth Day is just one day a year for so many people. It should be 365 days a year. Earth Day is every day. That's what it is for me as an environmental attorney. I've dedicated my life to this, growing up here in upstate New York going to school to study environmental geography, going to forestry graduate studies, becoming an environmental attorney after working on environmental policy in Congress. I'm representing communities every day that are suffering the plight of years and years of corporate industrial abuse, representing communities along the Hudson River. We used to get our drinking water out of the Hudson. I hear stories from my father about swimming in the Hudson as a kid, not knowing any better. It's ridiculous. We've been through so much, and I am just I'm outraged 
by this current administration. It is dangerous and it is radical what they're doing with respect to environmental policy. They're attacking clean water, they're attacking clean air, they're attacking the very policies that I've spent my life living in, breathing in. They have saved our communities. And that's why I'm running for Congress. I'm running to protect the Clean Air Act. I'm running to protect the water, Clean Water Act and ensure that all of our industrial abuses get finished, get cleaned up. That's why I'm running for Congress, so that our kids have clean air and water. Thank you. Thank you 
for putting this together. There used to be a time in our country, when, and in our region, when 40 hours of hard work paid you enough so that you could put food on your table and so that you could put some money away for retirement and maybe your children's education. But now we know in our district that 40 hours a week is often not enough. People are struggling to put the food on their table and certainly can't save for retirement. And so this race, to me, is about returning to our country that value that hard work is rewarded. It's about making sure that all people matter in our economy. And it's about making sure that everyone has a chance to realize their full potential. And it's from this that come the visions that I have for our district. One of them being 10 to 20 years from now, graduating seniors can stay or go depending on where they want to live, not whether they can find a job. It's the vision that 10 to 20 years from now, our rural region can be the model of revival for other rural regions. And inside of that is embedded the clean energy economy. We have the power in our district to teach other rural areas what an economy based on clean energy looks like, and I look forward to telling you more about my experience with that from the questions. So be between my public service, volunteer work with transitional housing and community meals, and my over 20 years in business, most recently in the economic development region, I know that I can not only unseat Elisa Fine, but move our district in that direction and realize these visions. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Patrick Nelson, and I'm here today from the small town of Stillwater, New York, along the banks of the Hudson River. Uh, I grew up in what is now an EPA Superfund site. Uh, for the first 18 years of my life, due to corporate irresponsibility from General Electric, myself and the other residents of the town and village of Stillwater, uh, unbeknownst to us, drank water contaminated with PCBs. Uh, so, environmental issues are incredibly important and personal to me in my life. I'm running for Congress because we have some very important decisions to make in the coming decades. Uh, we need to transition our energy systems from fossil fuel to renewable energy as quickly as humanly possible. I can't stress that enough. We are at a crisis tipping point in terms of our environment. If we do not make bold, responsible decisions very quickly, the creature comforts that we take for granted, our society and our very way of life are under threat. Our national security is under threat. Our economy is under threat. We talk a lot about a lot of issues um, throughout this campaign. But you get the greatest healthcare system in the world. If we do not take care of our environment, it's not going to matter. So this is a linchpin issue for the human race. And it comes back to something else that's tremendously important. There's a bottleneck in getting any work done in our government right now, and it's our corrupt electoral and campaign finance systems that have allowed the same people that told you that tobacco smoke didn't cause cancer to now go work as lobbyists for the fossil fuel industry, peddling the same kind of anti-science rhetoric that is harming our country, is harming our planet, and it has to stop, and it has to stop now. Thank you. where he worked with 
uh, Bloomberg as a journalist and then CNBC. Um, and at the height of the financial crisis, uh, was at a front row seat to see how his ideal idea of what America was crumble beneath him, how things were fixed in ways that he had not realized before, and how that a lot of people who had consolidated money and power really took away from the ability for all Americans to actually have fair opportunity and well-being in this country. Um, when he transitioned to MSNBC, he tried to dig more into politics, and he ended up leaving there as well because he wanted to work towards something bigger than that. Uh, when he left, he had started the Get Money Out movement, which accrued several hundred thousand people nationwide. And he also invested most of his life savings into helical holdings, which worked to make uh, small-scale solar-powered grid farming kits uh, that can produce clean water, electricity, internet, and food. And this was just one way he thought that he could start contributing toward creating a better world for everyone around us. Um, he is now here, uh, been back in Lake Placid, living there for the last six years uh, in New York 21, and he's here hoping to have the opportunity to represent the district and bring a lot of his ideas and his uh, knowledge to help work with everyone in here and show that together, though our political system is broken, everyone can come together to fix this. I opened up the door of my Prius and I set my feet on the ground at Standing Rock. And my life was forever changed. There was a full moon. It was the middle of the night. And I pitched a tent. And I tried to sleep. But I woke up many times to the sound of chanting and ceremony and prayer. The next morning I awoke and I popped my head up in the tent and I saw a little boy sitting on the back of a pickup truck in front of a teepee looking like this across the, the field that everyone was camped out in. And up on the ridge were men on horseback, bareback, painted ponies, like something out of a movie. And so my friend and I walked down to the river where women were praying and holding ceremony, dumping the waters that they had collected from people across the country into their water source, fighting and praying in their own best way for a brighter future for not just their children, but all children. Bald eagles flying over. Right here in New York 21, almost 20% of children live below the poverty line. The average income per capita in the North Country is only $27,000 a year. That is not enough. It's not enough to survive on. And those numbers keep people from doing more about these larger issues because they're stuck in survival mode. And that is what I want to talk about tonight. What are the solutions and how do we turn this around so that we can not only fight for our own children, but for all future generations to come. Thank you. All right. The first question is a warm up. They've already warmed up, so they're really ready to go. So here it is. How do you understand the role of government in addressing environmental issues? And what are the top three environmental issues, either global or regional, that you think require action by the U.S. Congress? Why those three and not others? And we're starting. Yes. Very good. Am I on? Yes. Good. All right. So I'm going to say what my three issues are, then I'm going to go back to talking about how you actually solve problems. My three issues are clean water, the anti-science attack on the truth that's happening, and this lovely little phrase I learned at your conference a week ago Friday, echo anxiety. So after uh, 
because I think I said I was in the White House partnership to reading the government for six and a half years. I went back to the Federal Aviation Administration and got to work on the strategic plan that brought together six, seven different government agencies and all the stakeholders, like airlines and manufacturers and runways, to modernize our airspace, airspace system. And this is what I learned. I learned about the power of a plain language strategic plan with roadmaps and timelines that bring people together to move forward as a network, not just a team, but a network. And I took that model into the work that I'm now doing in justice reform. So I took that model into transforming a citywide agency that wanted to change juvenile services. And then in New York City, with the commissioner wanted to transform probation. And earlier this year, with the office that wanted to transform the relationship across all criminal justice agencies and all neighborhood groups. So in dealing with an issue like water, or any of the issues that any of us talk about, and I think we all agree on most all of them, it's important to think through, all right, we want clean water, of course, what are the different chunks, what are the different parts to that problem, and how do we divide that up and put that into one plan that everybody can agree on and move forward with? And gotta be honest, I just blows my mind, I just heard, NASA wants to turn off the cameras that face the Earth in their distant weather satellite system. Sorry, Dr. How? Tom. Not gonna help, it's not gonna help. Thank you very much. Next, Katie Wilson. Lisa um, So as someone who grew up here in this incredibly beautiful, you know, dripping with natural beauty environment, um, I know what it's like to identify and, and, and be formed by my environment. And I think most of the people in this room do too, and most people across this region. Um, but our environment is also very much the economic engine. You can't hear. You can't hear. Is this better? So we're formed by our environment here, and we're informed by it, and we're also very aware that it's the economic driver behind tourism and so many of the things we rely upon. Um, we know that it's real, not just you and I, but the farmers and the loggers, everyone knows that the climate change is happening, whether or not they agree on, on who's causing it. Uh, it threatens our livelihood and our future. Now, the three areas that I really identify needing to address right now are health, our economy and jobs, and future generations. And right now, we all know that we need clear, clean air and water, but when I look around at some of the effects of climate change, I see Lyme disease as a huge issue right now. We must fund studies through the CDC to enable correct diagnoses and then make sure that insurance companies are actually providing care. It is bankrupting families. My, my own son was in tears the other night after coming out of the woods, so scared that he was gonna have ticks all over him, at, which we found some, and, and end up with Lyme disease like his grandmother. I mean, it's terrifying children from being able to go into the woods. It's a crisis. Now, in terms of jobs, the DOE must it is responsible for funding and regulating initiatives and incentives to make sure we can transition to a clean jobs economy. Um, Solar Vets program, great program. At Clinton Community College, they are training wind turbine technicians, which is the fastest growing job sector. And just to wrap this up so I don't get cut off, we have to protect our future generations, and that's clean air and water, it's a carbon tax. Thank you. Okay, um, so the, the part, first part of the question is role of government, and I see the role of government has two, two things. One, the government protects us, or should, protects us when we cannot protect ourselves. And the other role, and I think this is where sometimes Democrats, and I would venture to say Green Party uh, people, is that we see that government solves problems. Government is not the problem. That's important. Because right now, we have to solve our problem, the problems that face us in the environment. And one of them is clearly global warming. We have to talk about global warming. We have to be clear about global warming. 
and we have to come up with solutions to that, whether it's legislation and changes in our behavior. We also, I think, need to face the facts that science is important and that we, it's not a belief, it is. We don't believe in science, it is. And so we have legislation that could pass if we had power, okay? So we need to talk about that, legislation that would allow science to be on the forefront. Uh, the Scientific uh, Integrity Act, which Paul Tonko has, is one of the uh, leaders of, which, by the way, cannot pass because we do not have the power in the House and the Senate and the presidency, right? So that's the other thing we need. And the last thing is we need to invest in the future, the jobs in the future, the technology in the future, agriculture, right, wind, solar, biotechnology that will help us in the future. Those are the things that I think we need to invest in. Um, and uh, the problems, again, circling back to what is the role of government, the problems that we must solve. Um, I see the uh, three biggest issues as climate change, acid rain, and invasive species. And I think that the government should take a leading role on this because the government is charged with protecting our life, liberty, and our pursuit of happiness. And I think we should do that by creating partnerships at the federal level with our local governments. And I think we should focus on public-private partnerships. I know they work. The state has been doing a darn good job between NYSERDA and banning fracking within New York State. The federal government, on the other hand, thanks to the GOP leaders, as well as Elise Stefanik, who when push comes to shove, she will side with Paul Ryan and the GOP agenda every time against us. There are regulations that are helping New York 21 prevent acid rain, and she is diminishing those protections. So I, on the other hand, during this whole time she's been in Washington, have been working within our district with a leading economic development organization to implement that energy based on, excuse me, that economy based on clean energy. So I know it works. One example is we helped secure funding for public businesses who wanted to energy retrofit, uh, save on fossil fuels and heating costs, one of those being the Hotel Saranac in, in uh, Saranac Lake. Another project is that we know that municipalities are strapped for staff and cash, and so we hired some people to help municipalities start projects that will make them more energy efficient. And this means they are going to be hiring people within the private sector to do those energy retrofits, which means then that once they're done, they are saving taxpayer money. They can either be saved and not taxed, or it can go into other important projects. So that's one example of how public-private partnerships working with local government works. I'm sorry, I'm just I'm trying to get to get to these. And you know, the first part of the question, the role of the government in addressing environmental issues. Well, let me tell you what. Clean air and does not see state borders. Water does not see state borders. Climate change does not see any boundaries at all. That's why, precisely why, the federal government is the most important actor in addressing environmental issues, because they don't see boundaries. That's something that we forget all the time. And I'll tell you what the most, the three, most, I don't want to repeat what they said, but number one, Scott Pruitt. That's the biggest environmental issue in the country right now. We have a representative, Representative Stefanik. You're voting to roll back the Clean Air Act and you supposedly represent the Adirondacks? The Clean Air Act saved us from acid rain. Did she have a clue? <laughs> now, there's another issue because I don't want to repeat what, they're all great points. But the Superfund Act. I live my life in this realm. We all do, along the Hudson River. I represented communities that used to get their drinking water out of the Hudson. I represented the Mohawks up at Ankosazi. They were eating fish out of the river for decades, contaminated with incredibly high levels of PCB, guess what? Very high cancer rates. 
230,000 people actually die every year from half exposure to chemicals in the environment. So why do I bring up the super fund? The fact is the super fund is empty. It was a trust fund set up to do cleanups. Look at our cleanup on the Hudson River. It's not done. It's half done. They said when they did this cleanup that we would be able to eat fish after dredging within seven years. Now they're saying 54 years of it. Does that sound like a, a, a done job? If you, if you went and you had to clean up your room as a kid and you only clean up 20% of it, would your parents be happy? No. Well, the truth is we need federal money to finish these cleanups. The health of our communities depend upon it. And that's why I'm running for Congress. I want to make sure that the federal funds are in place to finish the job. Thank you. demonstrates our broken politics than the great shift we need to implement in response to environmental necessities. Instead, our politics, in exchange for campaign cash, continue to subsidize a failed and destructive status quo. We need to address our destructive energy systems, the centralization of profit with the resulting destruction of local economies, and degenerative agricultural systems. In addressing these issues, for the last half decade, I invested in and founded Helical Holdings, which produces solar-powered hydroponic greenhouses capable of producing electricity, internet access, clean water, and food. We must focus on creating more localized, renewable energy systems and revitalizing local economies and agriculture. position of going last on the zone. So the role of the government is twofold. Number one, it's setting goals and placing the incentives on the system to meet those goals. And number two, it's providing the emotional and emotional leadership that we need to convince ourselves that we actually can solve this problem because it is a daunting task. We need the kind of leadership that we saw when Jack Kennedy stood on a field at Rice University and proclaimed that we would go to the moon within the end of the decade. Now, there were no guarantees that was going to work, but we set that high water mark and we hit it because we had leadership. So in that way I say we choose to rise to the challenge of climate change and do the other things, not because they're easy, but because they are hard, because that goal will serve to test the best of our knowledge and energy, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one that we are unwilling to postpone, and one that we intend to win and the others as well. And I say that just to remind you what a president of the United States is supposed to sound like. <laughs> there are a lot of great things. Climate change is a huge issue. There's three parts of climate change we have to address. That's mitigation, adaptation, and innovation. We'll come to that, back to that a little bit later. Uh, we have to deal with the disposable society. We're generating a lot of trash, and we have a garbage patch in the Pacific Ocean the size of the state of Texas, conservatively speaking. So it's not just climate change, what this is going to do to our food chain is potentially disastrous and destructive. So we have to deal with that, like the thin film plastic bags and those other areas. But the most important thing that hasn't been talked about by anyone tonight is environmental justice. And environmental justice is saying that if you live in the same neighborhood as your congressperson, or the person that writes them a $2,700 check, you probably don't live on a Superfund site. You probably don't face the consequences of pollution. We concentrate the benefits in wealthy communities, and we concentrate the drawbacks in unwealthy communities. Um, to put this into context, Native American reservations are 4% of the land in the United States. They are 25% of the Superfund sites, and that includes two Superfund sites, the Aquasazni Reservation here in the 21st District. Thank you. Second, uh, either response to each other, or you can address the following follow-up question, or you can pass. Uh, if your prior, if you think your priorities for the environment differ from those of others in the 21st congressional district, explain the difference and how you would address the issues that you think others have that you haven't mentioned. Okay, thank you. I think actually I'll use this time to 
ask a question. And I'm sorry that Mr. Radigan isn't here to accept the question, but perhaps you'll take it back to him. And that is, why did you start Helicor outside of this district? It's based on solar, veterans, and farmers. Guess what we have an abundance of? <laughs> solar, veterans, and farmers. It is hard to start those businesses here, but Apex Solar did it and is thriving. Aztec did it and is thriving. Adirondack Solar Battery did it and they are thriving. Side. As a psychologist for 32 years, I'd be, oh yeah, government. And I know. Um, I was an independent candidate for president in 2015 and 2016. I drove, I was on the road 20 months, 70,000 miles. There's an enormous amount of pain and damage around this country and in this district, most of which is caused by bad government policy. <laughs> I'll say more the next time. very good viewpoints up here. And I think Pitt Dillon would say the exact same thing uh, in terms of Hewlett Bowl. All I know is that he did partner with a farm in California to help train and employ veterans. And when he did start the company, he had said, imagine if we were dropping bees in countries instead of bombs to actually produce uh, assistance and education and resources for so many people around the world. And I can't speak to the specific question, but that is kind of part of the broader idea of what the company is about. So one of the things is, um, I'm not going to do the typical political thing and pretend that a carbon tax or a price on carbon is a magic bullet. It's not. Uh, I'm the only one in this field now that Ron Kim has left that has signed on with the Off Fossil Fuels Pledge to co-sponsor the Off Fossil Fuels for a Better Future Act. That's HR 3671, has 33 co-sponsors in the House of Representatives and says we get off fossil fuels by 2035. And it does throw up, so not with a carbon tax, but more generally speaking, with supply side restrictions and end of subsidies. So the carbon tax, if you were to open a natural gas plant, they would say, okay, open it, here's the additional tax you're gonna pay. Supply side restriction says, I wanna open up a natural gas plant, and we say, no. <laughs> And that is when I, I refer to the facts of science, and I wrote this down. Um, you know, making speeches is easy. We cannot pass the legislation of all fossil fuels until we win this election, and until we win the Senate, and until we win the presidency. We have to be pragmatic. We have to face the reality that we can set lofty goals. But the role of government is to implement those because we have people in the right place at the right time. And that's where we are right now. I just want to make one quick point. We're going to have an intelligent discussion about these issues. It really makes my blood boil. Stop calling it global warming. I heard a couple people call it global warming. You want to know why we're losing on the issue? Because we keep calling it global warming. It's climate change. It's about volatility, it's about intensity and severity and unpredictability. So if we're going to talk about this rooted in science, it's about climate change. That's all I want to say. Uh, I, I really don't think many of our priorities are too different on this, at least the people in this room. But what I'm going to highlight is what I've actually been able to get done before even running for Congress. And that was to help in the Standing Rock Movement run a divestment campaign that was incredibly successful worldwide, and also help lead the effort to get those rusty rail cars full of toxicity out of the Adirondack Park. So we started to talk about climate change. Let's dive in. 
The U.S. Department of Defense says that climate change is a serious national security issue. There are two main types of security threats. One is the threat of weakening our military strength. Rising seawaters are already threatening key facilities in many of our U.S. naval bases, including our largest naval base in Norfolk, Virginia. The other type of threat is by making the world a more dangerous place. By increasing the number and scale of violent conflicts fought over dwindling resources such as land and water, and by forcing people off their land and onto someone else's. Our nation may be drawn into such conflicts, including our troops and Fort Drum, and resulting wars can provide fertile recruiting grounds for radical groups. Please tell us how you understand the role of climate change in compromising our national security and how you would act in Congress to make us more resilient to the security issues that climate change is likely to call. That's me first. Uh, we are at done. Is this a question number two? Yes. Oh, question two. <laughs> I got lost. I'm so worked up over this stuff. It's just, uh, if you can't tell, this is kind of my, what I've really lived my life in. And climate change, and I got very worked up when we were talking about the language of it. Uh, and there's a very important thing that I want to drive down that I wish the whole country would do when we're championing these issues. Because when we're talking about climate change, uh, it's very easy to put it on the back burner. But there's a much simpler message. It's a threat not just to the environment, it's a threat to our local economy. It's a threat to our human health. It's also a threat to national security. It's a very smart point. Uh, and I've been digging into this quite a bit recently. So there's two sides to this. What can we do to our uh, folks in the military to prepare them for this? We need to give them the resources, whether it's infrastructure-based changes that they're going to have to make to their military bases, due to rising sea levels or otherwise. There's a very tight tie between uh, climate change and infrastructure. We need to create resilient infrastructure that's going to adapt, and that particularly relates uh, to our military. They need to be strong and sound. Uh, with respect to the second component, in the increased volatility conflicts around the world, well, I say, why don't we get on top of addressing climate change and try to curb some of the effects? That's really what we should be doing, because it, it's an inevitability. We're living in it, and a lot of people, it's like the ostrich head of the sand thing. Oh, we're going to be living with climate change. A certain extent of that is true. But if we get on top of it, we can lessen these impacts, and that will decrease uh, the likelihood of engaging in climate-based conflicts in the future. Thank you. All right, I have a couple things to say. First of all, I don't believe the Department of I don't believe the Department of Defense is allowed to say that climate change is a national security issue anymore. It's like you know, sustainability or resilience. I'm not allowed to use that phrase too much, even though of course it is. <laughs> what I want to say is don't believe the lies and the myths. The Department of Defense has so much money that's wasted inside its budget, and that's separate from whether or not we ought to be bombing the heck out of places where we have no business dropping bombs and doing drone attacks. And we have killed four to six and a half million civilians in the Mideast, and it's time to stop. And when I talk about how you actually make real change in the real world, you have to understand that things are connected. So the damage we're doing to our planet and our environment here in District 21, Poverty, which is way worse than we really understand. I actually agree with some of Tetra's analysis. Whatever number you hear about poverty in District 21, double it. It's 20%, 40% of our adults. It's 40% of our children. In my school district, 70% of the kids are on free and reduced lunch. Poverty is a horrible issue up here, as is domestic violence, as is opioid addiction, as is the lack of, lack of good paying jobs, and it's all connected. And I do not buy, I worked in aviation for 22 years, including on 9-11, and I do not buy the myth that if we don't keep putting hundreds of billions of dollars into the defense budget, we will all be at risk. 
I say take some of that money out. There's plenty of it. There's a trillion dollars of waste in our federal government. And solve the problems that we have here at home, including in District 21. Continuing our ongoing failure of war policy in the Middle East, we can use resources, intelligence, and lives from the military and elsewhere to help create the shift we need. The military is one entity that does fully acknowledge climate change and its impacts. And just as I envision Newark 21 as an example of effective, tangible change to represent for the rest of the country, we in the U.S. can use our assets at home to create an example of needed and tangible change for the rest of the world. So twice since taking office, the current president of the United States. Okay. Okay. I thought it was. You can go. You're oh, sorry. <laughs> the military has been able to do is identify climate change in a nonpartisan way. That's an opportunity that we have. The military has actually identified climate change as an issue, and embedded in your question says that. The military has talked about climate refugees. The problem is, is that we, as a first world nation, are contributing to climate change, and yet we are not accepting refugees. We are contributing to the destabilization of other countries in the world, but we are not accepting the refugees, like in Syria. So what the military can do is lead, potentially, the charge of, like the Army Corps of Engineers, cleaning up, using all of the power that they have to do, as we might say, to do good. To help us, right, with the environment and to clean up the damage that might be done. Norfolk, Virginia, as we spoke about, is the, right, the rising sea levels, $1.8 billion. $1.8 billion right now if we were to solve the problem of the water encroaching. That doesn't include the military base. That's not Miami. So we know it's going to cost a lot of money. And we know that we have issues with managing our money. We have to face the facts, and then we have to invest in those solutions. That's the solving of the problem. And the military has, because they have not in a nonpartisan way been able to identify climate change, we need to allow them that opportunity to speak to science, to speak the truth of science. That's an opportunity that we have. Thanks. <laughs> so twice since taking office, the current president of the United States has bypassed congressional authorization and illegally, unconstitutionally, and irresponsibly bombed the sovereign nation of Syria. So one of the first things we need to do while we're talking about national security is Congress needs to wrest back control of our national security state from the White House and back in Congress where it belongs. Congress declares war, not the president. <laughs> But what does that have to do with climate change? Well, if you go back in the history of the Syrian conflict, uh, there was a drought, about 15 years, that caused subsistence farmers in rural communities to have to migrate into cities that were already stressed with infrastructure and were already economically strapped. So after they moved in, it increased uh, political unrest that already existed, because like a lot of areas in the Middle East, there is a, there's a secretary of difference between the majority government in Syria versus the population um, in terms of Sunni or Shia. And we see this happen a lot. This is one of the reasons for the cause of unrest. Um, so people protested. People asked more from their government. And the regime of Bashar al-Assad cracked down on that rebellion and thus precipitated the Syrian civil war. Now, it wasn't the only cause of climate change in the Syrian civil war, but it was a big cause of the Syrian civil war. And this is why it's very important that we understand that this is a threat multiplier. Uh, everything that is currently dangerous becomes more dangerous in regards to climate change. 
That's why we have to get off fossil fuels as quickly as humanly possible. That's why we have to take back our role as the leader of the modern world. We sit here in the United States of America, the only major country no longer a part of the Paris Treaty. The United States used to lead on international issues, and now the international community is leading without us. We're also the only other major country in the world that doesn't guarantee health care to all people as a right. I'm starting to wonder whether the definition of major country is going to continue to apply in future generations. This is why we need leadership, and yes, we need to win elections. So you said we needed to take back the House in order to pass the bill. So Thank you support you. the Office of Act then? Will you vote for it? So I could not agree more with the sentiment that it's a threat multiplier. It is multiplying the effects of immigration, climate refugee, as well as food security in exactly the way that poverty multiplies the effects of addiction, mental health, and so many other issues. Um, right now, the single greatest threat to a people is access to resources, is not having enough to eat or to drink or to provide for their family with. And when people are living in fear of not having enough food or water or the ability to provide, they will likely do anything to provide for themselves, for their families, for their communities, and for their country. And that doesn't always look pretty. So we have to face this. We have to be really honest about the fact that there really is not a larger issue at this moment. And that poverty and income equality are not mutually exclusive, that poverty, income equality, and climate change and environmental issues are not mutually exclusive. Everything is combined in this moment. So it is up to, in this moment, the DOE, the EPA, the FERC, and the, um, you know, the presidents, the whatever it's called, to come together and create a plan. We need a plan to get on fossil fuels. We need a plan to make sure that people are safe and that they are not scrambling for resources and therefore creating situations in which we are less safe and less stable and unable to live harmoniously. It is the greatest threat to global peace and national security. talking to a member of the Pentagon, as well as we know in our district, we have some military experts and diplomatic experts to help me learn about this. And there has been a recently released Pentagon uh, report that indicates that over 50% of our bases and military infrastructure are threatened and compromised due to climate change. And that threatens our military readiness, our responsiveness, um, and it is also with the international conflicts that are escalating because of climate change, it is putting more of our military service men and women in danger. And the 10th Mountain Division in our district is one of, is among the most uh, often deployed uh, army units in the country. And so people within our own district's lives are being put on the line a lot more. What I would do about this, uh, I would listen to the military leaders for their guidance on how to respond to the military or the national security threats that come about because of climate change. I would, act, I would also lobby to be on the Armed Services Committee so that on that I can keep front and center these issues of climate change and national security. Defense Secretary, Mattis actually does <laughs> believe in climate change. And he tells us that this needs a broad, whole government approach. I would also push to return those regulations that do work. It will be hard, but we must push in that direction. I would push to invest in clean energy infrastructure. And finally, as our population increases because people are coming to join us, 
we are going to have additional health care concerns. So I will lobby now to take care of our health care system with Medicare for all. So now the 30 second follow up to question two. And here's, you can either address each other uh, or anything anyone has said or comment on how to accelerate the transition toward renewable energy, if you think that's important, and whether nuclear power is part of the solution. 30 seconds. You can cover it later, too. A priority globally needs to be shifting to renewable power, and um, that's going to start with things like not subsidizing a dying fossil fuel industry and pumping them full of government money to keep them afloat. Um, that'll also help out when we have an administration that isn't fully advocating for what they do and start advocating for what is the inevitable future for everyone to have a healthier and more prosperous future. I agree that we certainly can't wait and we have to act now, but you can't just flip the switch on nuclear power. You can't just turn every natural gas pipeline off, which I know is a really unpopular thing to hear, especially from someone who's protesting a standing rock and running an investment campaign. However, we have to make sure that our solutions are working for our communities and that we aren't separating people from the environment because it's a comprehensive plan and transitions are hard, change is pain, but we have to slowly phase one out or quickly phase one out while we phase in the answer. So let's be realistic about our approach and what we can do to actually create change in the immediate. Um, I'll add one more. I'll use my time by adding one more thought on our district, national security and climate change. Um, for Trump, is on some as some endangered species. As the climate changes and gets hotter, we are going to have to be addressing that. And that is going to put the base at risk for closure in the next round of closures if the, if the temperatures keep. And uh, we know what the Army base means for our district. Over 1.2 billion in the economy, as well as almost 6,000 extra jobs. Another reason I'd want to be on the Armed Service Committee. Excuse me, I didn't see I think I'm next. Um, three quick comments. One, I didn't say the military doesn't understand about climate change. I said in this administration, they're not going to be allowed to use that phrase. So listen up, and you'll see it. Second thing I want to say is that military installations are creating some of the pollution and damage to the environment, and in, even though they have tons of money, are not being held accountable to fix the problems they're creating. And the third thing, and I learned this all over the place, and it has to do with the role of government, and it's that communities have to have input into the goals. It's not just the role of government. Thank like you. what we use to establish goals, communities need to have input. <laughs> Question: How are we going to switch to renewables? Yeah. So, uh, having worked in, I worked in Congress on the last attempt at a cap and trade bill, the Waxman Markey Energy Bill. We need to put a price on the cost of carbon. We are falling behind the rest of the world. The only thing that's switching us over to renewables right now is just pure market forces. You need to put a price on the cost of carbon. Now, whether that's cap and trade, like we tried to do, or fee and dividend, which is an excellent, aggressive way to drive down uh, carbon emissions, we need to do that, and that will spark. A uh, new clean energy economy. Thank you. So I think we need to transition and we need to focus more on supply side restrictions. Um, we shouldn't put a tax on something until we first stop subsidizing it. Um, and British Columbia actually rolled out a fee dividend program back in 2008. In the years since the tax has been fully phased in, the taxed um, Electricity sources have actually gone up in emissions and not down, and the carbon tax is potentially regressive in that it affects low-income communities more. So I think we need to transition through number one, ending subsidies, and number two, through stopping the permitting of new fossil fuel extraction and stopping the permitting of new fossil fuel um, energy plants. I wish we had more time on this one. And, uh, we'll come back. <laughs> Sends me articles, and 
and in preparation of this, he sent me an article, 98% of new, new uh, energy uh, production is solar and wind in the United States. 98% this year, January, February, new energy production is solar and wind. So I think that one of the things that we have to talk about is not looking backwards at um, like cap and trade necessarily, but looking forward at the market and the potential that we have. And maybe we can talk more about that. Thanks. We, we will, if we have time, come back to many of these issues. There are so many environmental issues. So this is question three. The current administration has made eliminating federal regulations a priority targeting environmental regulations in particular. Just a few that have been eliminated include sewage treatment, pollution rules, rules governing the dumping of coal mining waste, rules requiring braking system upgrades for trains carrying oil and ethanol. This deregulation is being presented to the public as pro-business and therefore good for the economy and job creation. What is your position on the jobs versus the environment framing of regulation issues? And if there is a genuine conflict between jobs and the environment, how do you think we should address this conflict? Well, I'll, I first, and I'll start from where I left off, and that is I think we need to own the frame. The problem is that the Republicans and this administration has framed it as an either or. You are either pro-business, or pro-environment. We are both. We are both. We have to own the frame. We have to take over the argument that they have somehow co-opted. And I'm going to venture to guess that we have a room full of activists here. We're educated. We're talking about it. We're in the room. So we have to also change our language. You know, when I ran, I ran against the largest dairy farmer in St. Lawrence County. He referred to me as that girl. He never once called me by name. By the end, when this company, Bion, wanted to move into St. Lawrence County, I went to John Greenwood, the largest dairy farmer, to say, that company is a boondoggle. I need your help and every farmer's help to understand what they are about to do to us and the St. Lawrence River. We have to work together. And in order to do that, we have to sometimes speak the same language. We have to sometimes show humility. We have to be patient. We have to find common ground. It's not either or. We have to own that. The compromise is power, not weakness. This administration is weak. <laughs> Donald Trump is weak. That's why he acts the way he does. And we need to model that strength. We need to own it. I just reject this whole premise entirely that they always throw at us. Being good on the environment is good for jobs. It's good for the economy. This is one of these typical scam arguments that they make. How do you think our economy was doing during the time of acid rain? Nothing the Adirondacks. Took a big hit. Talk to anybody in Lake George dealing with the E. coli outbreaks. How's that for the local economy, you know, at the south end of the lake? It's not good. What keeps the lake clean? Some common sense rules. It's a, it's a totally uh, ridiculous premise that they always throw at us, and we've got to throw it back with facts. Being good on the environment is good for jobs. And that's really what I'm so concerned about, because there's a legislative process, and we pack we pass these big pieces of legislation, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, they're being gutted right now in the rules. They're rolling back the rules, and that's all Administrator Scott Pruitt. The irony, the irony that this guy is going to get out of his job because of an ethics violation. What about all the environmental injustices he's committed? It's so ironic to me. It is one of the most lasting effects of this dangerous, radical administration. You can screw up a tax bill. We can fix it in a couple of years. You can screw up another thing and we'll pass a new bill later on. You ruin a water supply, that's potentially irreparable. 
And the damage is not just on the water, it's on human health, it's on our economy. It all lasts the, co the course of time. Thank you. So there absolutely uh, is no conflict between rising to the challenge of climate change and creating jobs. I mean, think about it for a second. Currently, the United States of America is 17% powered by renewable energy. Pushing that to 100% is going to take a lot of work. We're going to have to deploy a lot of windmills and a lot of solar panels. We have to build a 21st century modern electric grid, which is an infrastructure project the size of the interstate highway system. It has to be macro and micro. And we have to connect large areas so that we can deal with the intermittency problem, so that you might not have the wind blowing outside right now, but the wind's blowing somewhere. At the same time, we need to have a micro grid so that when increased storm activity comes through and we lose those long transmission lines, we have local power generation as a backup um, so that people can keep the air conditioning running in hot years and the heat going in cold years when storms knock out power. It's going to take a lot of work. This is going to take 20 or 30 years of potentially full employment to do. There's an idea being floated right now in the progressive movement of bringing back FDR's second bill of rights, namely a right to a job, a federal jobs guarantee. I am I'm waiting for the legislation, but if it is directed at deploying renewable energy, at fixing our grid, there's going to be work for 40 years. That's not just jobs, that's careers. That's $15 an hour plus. That's healthcare. That's benefits. That's consistent. That's union representation. And this is the other thing that we have to talk about, which is when we create the jobs, we need a just transition for the fossil fuel worker. Because when the coal mine closes up, that worker needs to get a job installing solar panels, needs to get a job rolling out wind or modernizing their grid because it's not the fossil fuel worker's fault. They just want to put food on the, fam on the table for their family. It is the executives, it is the CEOs, and it is the politicians that should be paying for this, not the workers, and that's why we have to have a just transition for workers. The GDP here in America was about $1,000 per person. And since then, it has risen to $64,000 per person. So don't tell me that environmental regulations are bad for business. Right now, especially when we look at offshore wind, we have an opportunity to power the entire eastern seaboard while putting people back to work. Those are thousands and thousands of jobs. Wind just here in the state has, considered, has created 146,000 jobs in the last year. So this premise is something that I also reject. And when I think about rolling out a jobs program, I do look to New Deal era programs. I look at the Civilian Conservation Corps. And there's a way to do that now without spending as much money because the private sector is drooling to create those jobs too, because they know that that's where their sustainable future is. It's something that helps everyone. It's good for business, it's good for people, and it certainly does not have to be an either or, but we have to frame it correctly. And we do have to talk about it with facts. We have to have data to back our ideas up, and we have to figure out how to pay for it. So this is where we roll in the private sector. And the person on the other side of the aisle that's saying, okay, well that sounds great, kumbaya, but how the hell are you gonna pay for it? We have answers. And we can talk about this in real time, and we can give people dignity back. Think about the dignity gained when you have purposeful work, and that is what we need in New York 21 right now. Well, there's a lot of agreement up here, so I agree, I agree. <laughs> It's a myth that it's jobs versus the environment. It just isn't. That's why there's so many cities and towns and corporations and states and other countries that are setting goals for 100% renewable energy. There's a business case for that. It's not just good for the environment. It doesn't just create jobs. So I think we're all in agreement about that. Well, I want to say a few words about how we transition to a green energy and a green environmental future. And 
there's like two parts to it with something in the middle. So one part is these big plans and these big laws that say we're going to have this huge infrastructure investment and it's all related, it's green energy, it's sustainable housing, it's green transportation near sustainable housing, it's healthcare for all or some version of public health that reaches everybody. It's all connected. So those are the grand plans that cost money, but as I said, a trillion dollars of waste in our federal government. The other part of that is how do we serve the people that are in dire need today? In this district, there are probably 100,000 people living in poverty. They're hungry. Their kids are hungry. How do we create those jobs that can serve them right away? My dad was in the Civilian Conservation Corps. I have these weird pictures. And decades later, my son, after he stopped being a steward for an off-campus conservation program, went into AmeriCorps, and I, it's an incredibly well-designed and brilliantly trained program. And I have talked about that both AmeriCorps and the Clean Energy Programs and Job Corps could absorb at least 200,000 people nationally and probably 10,000 people in this district. These are phenomenal, well-developed, well-trained, well-managed programs that we can take advantage of right away. Yes, it's not a choice between either growing our economy or saving our environment. The decision is, do we save our environment and grow our economy, or do we kill jobs and kill our environment? And you know where my choice stands. It would behoove us at this point to review on a regular basis uh, regulations, make sure they're not outdated, make sure there aren't any unintended consequences that have come from them. But by and large, on balance, it would be a big mistake to see it as a choice between business and the environment. We'd be paying a price with good jobs, uh, we'd be paying a price with businesses and tourism, property values would sink, and we'd be squandering an opportunity to create more jobs. And I know, this is where my vision of 10 to 15 years from now, we are the model for a clean energy economy in a rural area. I know it's possible because I've done it. And I had the pleasure, my staff and I we were visiting, it was right here in, in Queensbury that I was able to help with Apex Solar. We visited them this afternoon. Five years ago, when I was with the Economic Development Organization, we knew that community members wanted solar. We knew that solar companies were struggling. And so we stepped in with some seed money from uh, the state government to bring these two together. And since then, so this was a public-private partnership, since then, over those last five years, jobs at Apex Solar have grown by 100. So they were at 30 then, they are now at 100 now. And to keep their business growing, they are going to start partnering with the local BOCI system in order to train our graduating seniors. And isn't that what we need to give them good paying, quality jobs to keep them here? It's possible and we can do more of it. And that's why I want to go to Congress. So the attempt to deregulate at the federal level is simply a last ditch effort to protect dying industries. These measures are only pro-business for the people buying our politics. Eliminating these regulations also eliminates jobs and ignores the fact that the renewable industry is increasingly providing more and more jobs each year. We need a transformational shift in our economy out of the 19th century and into the 21st, and the government needs to help lead this shift. So now the follow-up question three, uh, are there some specific environmental regulations that we should pass to help folks in the 21st Congressional District or some we should be very careful to keep? Or address the other. Well, first and foremost, we do need to maintain the Clean Power Plan to present, prevent the return of acid rain to the Adirondack Park. 
Um, that's tremendously important, and that alone is a reason why Lisa Bonnick shouldn't be reelected. Um, in terms of regulations, so right, right, supply side regulations that we need. We need a moratorium and any new fossil fuel extraction in the United States, and that includes in the Arctic. Um, we need to stop the permitting of any new fossil fuel uh, energy generation. No more new gas-fired power plants, no more new coal-fired power plants, no more permitting on that. And we need to remove the subsidies from fossil fuel companies. Any of the protections, lots of regulations, but protections is more uh, palatable in many areas. Any of the protections that help curb fossil fuels, we need to keep because they are the contributors to acid rain. We haven't been talking about acid rain for 20 years, and now, thanks to the incumbent, it's back. <laughs> we also need to make sure that we maintain any regulations that help us cut down on invasive species. Um, invasive species stamp, <laughs> that's not going to do it. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to let everybody, I'm just I'm having this moment where I'm just like, this is amazing. I was watching the forum back, it was interesting, the first forum we did was, it was at ACC back in August, and I think, look at how everybody's grown, and I was shocked. I get everybody a round of applause on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> is just one example. What are your priorities for the use of public lands and how would you deal with the conflicts? So people have wondered, wondered why throughout the course of this campaign 
I have stressed the issue that none of us should accept uh, corporate PAC uh, money as Democrats in this primary. And it was for this moment right here. Don, are you accepting any corporate PAC money? No. Ted, are you accepting any corporate PAC money? You know what? I, I actually... Okay. Emily? Emily? Okay. Emily? Oh. Emily? Oh. Dylan's not. Katie's not. Uh, Pat, I, you know, I'm, I'm like rejecting this, so I think it's, it's like pomp and, you know, I'm, I'm not going to So, yeah. well, that was supposed to be something else. Like... No, the point that I was going to make is that a corporate-funded Democrat will not be the next congressperson in this district because none of these people are going to accept that kind of dirty money. And the Green Party is going to have to come up with another talking point to try and steer votes from us in the general election. <laughs> so, in regards to the public land, Yes, we need to protect and preserve public land. Something dastardly has happened in this country where conservation has stopped being conservative. You know, the, the original national parks came out of the Republican Party, came out of Teddy Roosevelt as a great conservationist. So what has happened to the conservationists and the conservative movement as we are rolling back um, the use of public lands in this country? Uh, we have to protect those lands. We have to protect the wildlife, especially as population continues to grow. So, yes. Um, I'll bank the rest of the time. Okay, first, I, I actually would like to apologize. I find um, the challenge um, insulting. I have been a legislator, and I served every person with dignity. Whether or not they gave me a dime, or whether or not they gave me $10 to help me run. Some of you have given me money. I am honored. Some of you have not. And I will serve you. That's what it means to be a leader. The reality is we need to undo Citizens United. And we need to focus on it. And I, I think grandstanding is something that our president does, and I do not think is something that we should do. Now, the question at hand, the Adirondack Park is a fantastic example, an amazing example of what we can do with public land. We live in the park, and we have businesses in the park, and we are successful in the park. Do we have arguments? Yeah, that's why we have groups that get together. We have environmental groups. We have business groups. I just went to the at local Adirondack um, uh, local government conference talking about how do we further those businesses that are in the park. So what, when we look at our national uh, forests or our national land, we often talk about it as an either or. Again, getting back to the either or and we can really follow the model of New York State and the Adirondack Park as a way of looking at the, the, the way we can live and function, uh, survive, thrive in a beautiful area. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done, and I got off a little bit there, but I apologize. Thanks. Um, why I think national parks and state parks, like our amazing experiment in Blue Line, are so important goes to the fact that environmental issues have been so deprioritized. They don't really pull very high. They're on the back burner for most people. And that, it makes my heart break when I, when I think about that. And I think about the reasons for that. And we live in this modern era. We spend more and more time looking at a screen, sitting at a desk, not connected to the land like we once were. And I want to tell you how I became so embedded in these environmental issues. Like my grandfather was a farmer, had a farm in Half Moon. My dad was an avid fisherman and made me an avid fisherman. And this life that I spent outside, fishing with my dad and working outside, tied to the land. And that developed that passion. Now the reason I mention that little upbringing is because the national park system and parks in general help reconnect people to the land. 
And it's so important because when you do that, when they have those opportunities for recreation and for reinstilling the importance of taking care of our land and being good environmental stewards, that moves the issues up the list. It reconnects people to the land. And that's one of the best, best things we can do. It will have benefits for generations and generations to come. And that's what I want to have happen. And that's why we have to have a very, very strong national park system. Thank you. Um, I'm not feeling very well this evening, but this topic makes me even more nauseous. <laughs> um, interestingly, though, the greatest steward of public lands in this country has been the United States government. And that's what we need to get back to. They have kept our land safe by keeping them in a private, excuse me, a public trust that has allowed all of us to have access, and all of our children, and children to come. And right now, if we were actually going to be fiscally responsible, we would be expanding access and use of public lands, because it employs more people than coal, the outdoor recreation industry that is, it employs more people than coal, natural gas, and oil combined. And people actually spend more money on it annually than electronics and automobiles. So if we want to be responsible, let's look at the numbers. If Trump wants to run the country like a business, you might want to take a second look at the balance sheet. Um, but I'd also like to broaden this conversation because it's not just public lands, it's also overuse in the Outdoor Neck Park, hiker parking. It is also mineral extraction in the desert. And what we have to do to reach solutions and, and come up with a way to solve solutions and enhance and bolster communities is to work with the people in those communities and make sure that we aren't leaving people behind. So again, these issues are solvable, but we must make sure that we're including all voices at the table so that we can make good decisions. Continuing to treat our national treasures as disposable liabilities is a grave mistake. Preservation of these natural assets is a necessity and additionally creates jobs and massive amounts of revenue for the government. National park tourism alone generates tens of billions of dollars in the United States. We have already reduced species biodiversity by more than half worldwide and this is a trend that will inevitably be hugely consequential to humans. We have to reduce the threats and risks imposed upon our Earth and treat it as the invaluable sustainer of life that it is. Well, I don't want Tedra Cobb to be the only one who said that Mr. Nelson's behavior was grandstand, grandstanding and insulting. And I do believe that one of the women on this stage will be replacing Elise Stefanik in the room. And it's not just an issue of corporate funding. There's a new survey that said three quarters of Americans are giving up on politics because they believe the two-party system is corrupt. New York State ranks 41st of the states in voter participation. Voters, they're not voting. So I think that we all have to reach beyond the traditional talk and be honest with ourselves about what's going on with our parties. Green's got its issues too. And figure out how to talk to real people about real issues. And it goes back to what I said before. Good government policy, which is rare, requires the participation of New York State residents and the American people. You can't make good public policy in a vacuum. And there's example after example about the failures of government when it didn't listen to we the people. And how we use our public lands is one of those issues, because I've been all over and it's a lot of, I love this place, you know, I'm choosing to live here. A lot of it works really well, there are pieces of it that don't. And the further west you go, the more people have issues about how public lands are treated. 
and how they are kept away from public lands. I wrote an article with someone who doesn't believe in climate change, and we, talk, we ended up talking about common ground, and we made a list of our shared vision and the actions that we could take. We have to bring in people that don't necessarily agree with us and don't even use the same language. I'll start by speaking to the environmental land use conservation uh, equation in our district, uh, which we manage very well. Um, I would like to work, um, and I support the Adirondacks Association of uh, Villages and Towns and their 2018 legislative agenda, which I'd like to be able to help them in implement. We need more broadband. We need more cell coverage. And if Elise had been paying attention to that, instead of pushing a health care bill that would have decimated us, she would have been pushing her party to form an infrastructure bill instead. Uh, but turning to, turning to the federal uh, level, this is more than an environmental issue. This is another case of the federal government focusing on taking assets and putting them to those people who already have for the benefit of a few and taking them away from the rest of us. That is what this is also about. This federal government is taking these lands, giving them to the state, and the states are already putting into place legislation that will allow the states to give them to companies, wealthy individuals, so that they can be developed. And the amount of money that goes into these local economies from this tourism, 646 billion. 6.1 million jobs are at stake for this. Now fortunately, again, here in our district, we don't have to worry about that. Our local leaders, our state leaders, we are good stewards of the earth because we know that as our environment goes, so goes our communities. So I look forward in Congress to continuing the partnerships that our local governments are already creating in order to grow our economy by working with the environment rather than with against it. For the good of everyone, for an economy that works for all of us. So short follow-up for question four. And you can address this question or any of the other things that have been mentioned. We know, as several of you have said, that rural economies often significantly benefit from tourism on public land. Yet such tourism increases as land becomes more accessible. This happens in the Adirondacks where, as several of you have mentioned, there are serious issues of overcrowding. How might we address this tension? Um, I, I'm happy to have this because my brother is actually uh, the town supervisor in Keene and working very intimately with um, hiker parking issues and overuse issues and it's uh, something I'm very familiar with on a personal level and I believe the answer is marketing. We need to direct people into underused and underserved areas of the park while also bolstering those communities economically. You know, if we can not just direct people there, but also make sure there's broadband and that their cell phones maybe work so they stay overnight and, you know, buy some food and, you know, have a reason to stay, it's going to be much more uh, beneficial for all these local communities and the Adirondacks as a whole. I think Katie hits the nail on the head. It's marketing. Uh, we have a park that's over six million acres. Everybody's going to do Cascade on the weekend or, or Algonquin or right. You know, we, we got to spread out the wealth. Um, a lot of that is tied to marketing and making sure that people know of the wealth of opportunities within the blue line and there's a lot, a lot that can be done with that. I think there's some infrastructure components too to make sure that certain parts of the park are more accessible, that certain uses are more accessible, and that's a balance. Uh, we got six million acres to plan. Let's spread the wealth. Thank you. It's not grandstanding to ask that candidates for a federal office take a leadership position on the fundamental reason that our government can't get anything done. It's not grandstanding to ask that Democrats in this district stand alongside Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, Senator Bernie Sanders, Senator Kamala Harris, Senator Elizabeth Warren, um, Randy Bryce, and other leaders that are making this movement possible that we get the corporate influence out of the Democratic Party. 
Elise Stefanik held a town hall in Moreau where she said, her contributions don't influence her votes. The entire room laughed. Thank you. It, I, I banked a little bit of time. If you are asking, if you are asking to believe that someone can take money and not be influenced by that money, you are asking to be deceived. Thank you. I do think that something we <laughs> I do think that something that we should re-explore, and I know it comes up um, every few years, is the idea of a fee of sorts uh, within the park. Now, I am very conscious of what I said in my former answer. So I think that as we explore it, let us make sure that anyone in our entire district, <laughs> uh, especially if they have children, no fee. Because that is where children learn the benefit of the outdoors. Um, I, I think um, one of the ways that we can manage um, is to invest in the upkeep of those trails. So when I was a legislator, we had a youth conservation corps. Um, because we just don't have the money for it, uh, for many reasons, one of them is Medicaid and uh, property taxes, we can't manage it. We don't have a youth conservation corps anymore. So I think that we could change how we're funding uh, our taxes and locally and invest that money into a youth conservation corps uh, so that kids, young people, can start working again. Clean. Oh, yeah, pass. Clean up. <laughs> manage, manage the, the trails. <laughs> It's important to keep in mind that District 21 is losing population, that we are getting slightly older, if that's possible, and we absolutely have to do something to attract younger families. I live in Stream Lake, and I think I've talked to just about every small business owner in that town, and we, I, the small business, feel left out. We do not feel part of the conversation, and small business owners even if when you drive, the one thing I hear is when you drive up the North Way, you don't even see what's in Thank these you. small towns. Uh, I agree that marketing and education are definitely important things. Uh, we've become very separate from this earth that we are so intrinsically a part of. And everyone's drawn to it despite that fact, so it's very important that we learn as human beings, how to reintegrate into the earth and peacefully interact with it, whether it's going to parks or working on renewables or whatever it may be that we need to do to have a more healthy and productive future for ourselves. And now the fifth question. And we're going through some pretty significant issues and really appreciate everybody's attempt to keep it crisp. <laughs> According to the United Nations estimates, there will be approximately 9.6 billion people living on Earth by 2050. Two billion more people than today. Some scientists are calling our age the Anthropocene because humans are having a dominant impact on ecosystems around the planet. How should Congress be anticipating the impact of future population growth and its effect on biodiversity and the ecosystems that support human life. What kinds of legislation or other initiatives might be necessary to address these effects? Question five. Okay. I'm hopeful that through innovation and intellect we can figure this out. And hope is a blessing, and it's not something that the evangelical far-right side that at least Stefanik quite often sides with has. We have it on our side, hope. So let's keep it. This is an issue of population control, which leads us right to reproductive rights. And President Trump just reinstated the gag rule. And that means that millions of women overseas are losing access to contraceptives. 
That is unconscionable. We need to invest, particularly in low-income areas overseas, in programs and services that will allow for voluntary family planning in those areas. That is what women want, and that is what families need. <laughs> and let's not forget, in our own country, continuing to support Planned Parenthood. is to protect wetlands because those may be the food and those may be the medicine for generations to come. That sustains biodiversity. And finally, that intellect that I mentioned, let's invest in public education again. That is what is going to create the stability that we need. So let us pay teachers what they're worth. Let us put assessments into the hands of the teachers. They are the professionals. They know what is best for their teachers. And let us make them, keep them responsible for our children's destiny because they are doing a darn fine job. Healthy systems feed off one another and create a surplus rather than a deficit. Our current systems mine resources and natural systems as if they are infinite and are leading us down a path that can only end in a de destruction. We need to prioritize the well-being of our planet and the entirety of humanity. The great destruction of ecosystems, plants, and animals must stop and we must shift to an understanding of living with and through the natural systems that give us life. Um, I would just like to comment that it is, you know, undeniably true that humans effect and, and climate change in general is going to have traumatic effects, um, you know, both economic and social around the world. And it is our job to keep warming under two degrees if we want to have somewhere to live and if we want future generations to have somewhere to live. And the best way to do that is to regulate emissions and greenhouse gases. So what we must do is employ a carbon tax, and it does work. I mean, yes, you have to decentivize, but you also have to ta tax in order to not incentivize. I mean, they're one and the same. And the regional greenhouse gas emission programs are wonderful on the state level, and it's great to see New Jersey and Virginia coming in to play, to play ball, but it's not enough. These patchwork solutions around the country are not enough, which is why we need FERC to come in and Congress to act to create federal legislation that actually produces the kind of regulation we need and puts a carbon tax out there because it's the smartest and the most effective way to bring everything back where, where it needs to be for us to have a livable world. Um, I have a minute left. Life on Mars? I don't know. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to defer the rest of my time to, to respond to something a couple other people said earlier, before and hopefully without having to run to the bathroom. <laughs> So this is a touchy subject when you start talking about <laughs> it's a touchy subject when you start talking about population control, population growth, because it reminds people of things like the Chinese one child policy and things of that nature that are incredibly restrictive upon personal freedom. But I think Emily said it beautifully. Number one, it is the empowerment of women worldwide. Um, to make their own reproductive choices, but it's also economic development worldwide that helps support people. When people are economically secure, when they have access to health care, water, food, resources, when they don't live in stress situations, they opt by themselves to choose to have less children. This is why we have to rejoin the Paris Accord to begin investing in these countries to allow them to develop to a renewable energy economy. 
And we also have to stop the economic hitman. We have to stop foreign development through debt that is a means to extract resources from the third world that does not invest in the third world and keeps people in cash-strapped and desperate situations that leads to more births and it leads to more consumption. So it's through fair, humane investment that actually values the human beings worldwide and doesn't just value the human beings that live here in the United States that we can deal with the issue of population without restricting the freedoms that we've come to know and love and the ability for everybody to make their own decisions in regards to their family. So that's what we need to do. Brazil is a great example of why or how, not why, but how population is changing. And it's through soap operas. It's through soap operas. It is because people have access to watching TV, and they're watching soap operas, and women are educated and are having fewer children on the soap operas. And in fact, what is happening is that women are having fewer children because of that. It's called soft power. It's called access to TV or education. When women are educated, and I agree with Emily, when women are educated, but also when they have access to birth control, and also when they have access to health care, then they're able to make those choices. They're able to work. When they're able to work, then they will make choices not to have as many children. It's, it's, this, it's the cycle that we want to support and perpetuate. So that is one thing globally, I think, is that we can uh, and should be kind of leaders in that soft power. Um, when we share, and you know, does anyone remember Dallas? <laughs> All over the world, people watched Dallas. And, and, and so that's an interesting thing, because these are the kinds of cultural changes that we have an opportunity uh, to, to uh, further. Um, let me see, I wanted to look at my notes, because I actually had a couple things here I wanted to talk about. Oh. And it was, if you look at legislation from the last 60s, 70s, we have not had new legislation on the environment since 1990. We are stuck. And so we need a climate, we need climate change legislation. And, and that, that's really the last thing I wanted to say about this question. Thanks. I agree with a lot of, of most all of what Emily stop. <laughs> and what Jenny said. <laughs> it was hard to hear uh, Katie from here. Um, so I'm not going to repeat it. I want to talk about something else. There's a lot of pain in this country. There's a lot of pain in this district. There's a lot of anger, but under that is a lot of pain. And it's true for our veterans, it's true for our men and women in uniform. It's true for children and families that have been caught up in the abuses of our foster care system and family court, which is a whole other issue. It's true for people in our district that can't really afford to keep a roof over their head and are making decisions every day about food or transportation or heat. So the hard issue is how do we balance taking care of people here in District 21 with being an honest broker on the international stage and having realistic and transparent decisions made about international development. And I think some of that anger in this country and in this district, because I listen a lot, um, is because the messaging is we're going to take care of everybody else out there, and you know, you'll know, you get yours sooner or later. It's not working. People are losing interest in politics. They don't. I, when I started as a presidential candidate, 19% of Americans trusted government to do the right thing. Hello, it's 3% now. You know, cockroaches do better. <laughs> there, 
it's a balance. It's all connected, as we keep saying, education and health and the environment and military policy and foreign policy and economic development here at home and around the world. It is all connected. We have to be really clear about the language that we're using and making sure we understand the pain here at home. Thank you. The question is about really two things, uh, population growth and biodiversity. That was the second part of the question, biodiversity. And it's great to hear the responses. It, it, here's an interesting fact for you. It took millennia to get to a billion people on the planet. It wasn't until the beginning of the 19th century. Then it only took about 115 years to get to two billion, okay? To get to three, it took 30. And then since then, we've been adding about a billion people every 10 to 15 years. That's what we're dealing with. Now, it's incredibly important that we assist in development across the world because as a country develops and they have access to health care and contraception and, and education, the fecundity rate drops down. So that's why that's such an important part in curbing population growth. It is vital. We can do it. We have to assist countries around the world in developing and having access to basic fundamental human rights. Now, the second component, biodiversity. And you can value biodiversity, having however many species we have on this planet. For the sake of that, I certainly do. But it, it's tied into many things that affect our daily lives, like our ability to grow food. Okay, so legislatively, what should we do? One of the biggest threats to our ability to provide food are invasive species. Uh, and invasive species have all sorts of threats. I went to forestry school to study something that was originally from Asia. It was called Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. It's from Asia. You know where it is now, as of this year? Prospect Mountain. All sorts of unforeseen consequences, and we can promote and protect biodiversity by addressing uh, invasive species, making sure there's resources to prevent. Because if there's more people on Earth, there's more commerce, there's more mixing of things in shipping crates and ballast water. So we need to go after invasive species. And my last point, I could talk about this forever, I'm sorry, we're running out. But how we're growing our food. Huge monoculture all over the country. What happens when a pathogen or a pest gets in in that event? You're wiped out. Thank you. We need to promote diverse agriculture. Thank you. We have about eight minutes left. And rather than do a follow-up question on this, what I'd like to do is to have each candidate have a minute to just either address something you haven't addressed that you're passionate about or sum up your views for us. So one minute to each and we'll use the order from question six. Um, I want to take my minute to address something, a couple of things that were said earlier and not in an attempt to undermine my fellow candidates, but in an attempt to have an honest conversation about policies that we may or may not actually be able to employ or may or may not actually need. Um, two comments were made about uh, overuse in the Adirondack Park. Uh, the first was from Emily about installing a fee. And the problem with that is that then you have to staff collection sites for the fees. And with a 2% cap on local taxes, you can't do that. So this is an issue that's been discussed for a long time, and it's there's not a solution involving fee that's feasible yet. Uh, the second was to Tedra's um, point of um, uh, youth conservation program. Well, we, we already have ATIS. Maintenance of the trails is not an issue. Between the DEC and ATIS, that's covered. And, and so what we need to do is redirect people, because you know this is an important issue, and I just want to make sure we address it correctly. Thank you. And an informed My name is Emily Mars. I live in Saranac Lake, and I would like to earn your support and your vote on June 26. And so I want to put a fine point upon what an opportunity our district has by focusing on clean energy and protecting our environment. I know that we can implement in Congress 
standards, protections, regulations, whatever you want to call them, until we're in the majority. But I am really optimistic that we are going to be in the majority come the end of 2018. And once we implement these carbon fossil fuel standards, that is going to break open all sorts of opportunities in our district. For example, heating. There is already a geothermal uh, heating company in Boston Spa. And if we were required to switch over to non-fossil fuel burning uh, furnaces, that would mean a whole lot of new jobs in this district for us instead of us sending it outside to companies that don't reside in our area. Thank you very much. There are two things I would like to say from here. How many of you went to see Elise Stefanik uh, recently? How many of you heard her say that she would get rid of Pruitt? Yeah. Here we are. Every single one of us can say we care about the environment. Elise Stefanik says she cares about the environment. Actions speak louder than words. The opportunity we have right now is to get rid of Elise Stefanik. And the only way to do that is to use her words and her votes. Every single one of them against the environment. Every single one of them against health care, and every single one of them against her own district that she's supposed to represent. I would like to represent you. I have lived here for 30 years. I have made Northern New York my home. I have lived my environmental values. I have served my community in health care and education, and I hope to do so in Congress. And I'd like to say thank you for tonight and for being able to speak with you. I would just like to say what a treat this was for me tonight. I think everybody got the sense. I love talking about these issues. Um, I've spent my life trying to be a champion on the environment, whether it was as a forester, as a student, forestry student, or working in Congress as a legislative aide on environmental policy. Right now, trying to take care of our communities so that our kids have clean water, so that we finish the job of cleaning up some of these pollution sites. And, that's what my life is all about, and I would be honored to be able to do that for you in Congress. You know, I worked in Congress when we were working on the last climate change bill, and we got it passed in one house, one chamber, but it failed in the other chamber of Congress. It would be my honor to be your representative and get back into Congress and finish the job and finally address climate change and clean air and clean water. So thank you for being here. Uh, I appreciate it. <laughs> June 26th Democratic primary, but I do expect you to send the best woman forward <laughs> to meet me in the November election. <laughs> this is simple. You want to demonstrate to the people of District 21, the voters and visitors, that you care about the environment, that you want to transition to green energy, send a green to Congress. <laughs> You want to demonstrate to the rest of the state and the rest of the country, you want to send a message to Washington, D.C. and the world, where the Green Party is the largest political party on the planet, make history. For the first time in the history of the United States of America, send a Green to Congress. And not just any Green, they call me the government mechanic, send the government mechanic, send the Green mechanic, Vote green, make history, and nothing magical about everybody up here on the stage. Run for office. Run for office, all of you. I'm doing ready. Um, <laughs> I think we can agree that there's a lot of uniformity in the room about how to address these problems. Pick any issue and we're probably going to agree on most of what we're talking about. And we know the solutions exist as well, whether that's creating an infrastructure bank to invest in all of these projects, or whether that's starting to work on renewable energies, or whatever it may be, the solutions exist. But first and foremost, 
they're going to have to address, acknowledge, and fix the broken political system. And we all have to come together, not only in this room, but outside of this room, even across the aisle at times, to come together and figure out how we together can all fix this. Thank you for inviting us tonight. It was a great pleasure to be here. So we are in a crisis moment in human history and in United States history. We don't have time to waste, we don't have time to lose, and we must take immediate action. But with crisis also comes opportunity. Uh, for, the Northern, for Northern New York, New York's 21st Congressional District, we're likely to experience a longer growing season while we lose farmable land nationwide due to increased flooding, uh, sea level rise, as well as higher temperatures. This means there's going to be increased demand on the agricultural products that come out of New York 21. That's why we have to invest in our infrastructure here, to make it easier for our farmers to get goods to market, uh, because we're going to be feeding the broader Northeast region in generations to come. And we need a member of Congress that will build a coalition with the Northeast region that understand that the constituents in Connecticut, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, just like the constituents in New York 21, like to eat food. And we are going to be the breadbasket of the Northeast in the coming years. And this is why we need to send someone to Congress with a vision and that will work to solve these problems. I hope during your vote on June 26th. Thank you. I don't know about you all, but we have learned a lot here. And we so appreciate the wisdom that you all have shared with us. But most importantly, the sense of hope and inspiration that you have all brought. Thank you again for being here, and thank you so much for running.
Hi, Tedra. Hi. Hi, my name is Grayson Thick. I'm a student at uh, South Glens Falls High School. Oh, great. Um, I'm, for my politics class, we're doing a project on, we have to go to an event and interview the candidates. I was wondering if I could uh, interview you. Yes, sure. Possibly ask some uh, questions that we were given in class. Yeah. Uh, the first one, who will you vote for in the Democrat uh, gubernatorial primary, Cuomo or Nixon? Because we were discussing that in class. Yes. It, I, I'm not evading the question, but I think it's too early. Okay. And I, what I did was I went to her website yesterday um, because somebody actually said, what are you thinking about this? And I thought, you know, I should look. I'm paying so much attention to my own race. Okay. Um, she doesn't have her policies up yet. Okay. Um, so to me, it's a little bit too early to, um, to know who would, uh, I'll vote for. Um, you know, you probably remember because you were in 2008, what grade? Maybe oh, sixth like first grade? First or, or second grade. Okay, first or second yeah. grade. So, Governor Cuomo cut school funding mm -hmm. in 2008 because of the economy. Um, I fought to restore school funding. So, I have, you know, like many people, this love hate relationship with Governor Cuomo. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that Cynthia Nixon has never held elected office. Um, and I would like to see that before becoming a governor. So okay. I think it's just too early for me to know which one in the end, you know, I've got till September. I want to see more from Cynthia Nixon. Okay. Uh, Good next, question, though. Next one. Do you believe Donald Trump should be impeached? I mean, uh, they, were, they voted about 60 progressive members of the Democratic caucus a few weeks ago voted to impeach him. Did you support that? Or? Okay, so I do not, right at this point, think that the president should be impeached only because, and this is, you gotta be clear here, okay. I do not trust this Congress. Mm -hmm. So impeachment is a process, it's a hearing, and given that Let's say the set, the uh, Congressional Intelligence Committee just said that the president wasn't culpable uh, with regard to Russia. I know you're hearing, you're listening here. Um, I don't trust them with regard to impeachment. Um, so that really, for me, is at this point the only reason. Okay, uh, a couple more short ones. Sorry to keep you. Hanging sure. Around. Um, do you support new progressive dem uh, leadership, or the or would you do support like? Nancy Pelosi for the House Speaker. Uh, that's a great question. And it sort of gets to your question about Cuomo. I would like to see other people's names put forward, okay. at which point I could decide. So let's let's hope that I'm elected, and let's hope that there are new names put forward, and then you can look at each person. I, I'm, not, I'm not beholden to anyone, nor will I be. Okay. Uh, next one. Do you support single payer health care? Yes. Okay. So whether it's Medicare for all, right, or whether it's Medicare down to 50, I'm 50, um, or and uh, Medicaid filling in or something else, but every single person should have health care in the United States. Okay. And last one. Um, do you support legislation for stricter federal gun laws? Yes, absolutely. Um, we have an epidemic of gun violence. Your generation is taking the lead, and we need to listen to what you're saying. You want stricter gun laws, and you're right, and we need to follow that lead. Thank you very much, Tedra. Thank it was you. nice meeting you. Thank you.
Take a minute, come through the place. Hi, sorry. Oh, hi. <laughs> I'm all for a vision to the military or an student at South Glens Falls High School. I'm doing a report on yep. um, like political rallies, stuff like that. So I decided to come here. I was wondering if I could uh, ask a couple questions. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Um, the, huh? Sorry, being so dignified. <laughs> so who will you vote for in the New York? Thank you, oh, thank you very much, sir. Who will you vote for in the New York Democrat gubernatorial primary? Cuomo or Nixon? I am, I'll be absolutely honest with you, I am still thinking about my decision. Uh, I think both candidates offer some things of value. I think there's experience in the governor's side, but I think Cynthia Nixon has better ideas. So I am uh, I am available to both candidates for any consult if they want to discuss issues that affect the North Country. And based upon those conversations and based upon how things develop, I'll be making a decision. And when I decide who I'm voting for, I'll let people know. Uh, but that's where I'm at right now. Okay. Uh, do you believe President Trump should be impeached? Would you have voted with the roughly 60 progressive members of the Democratic caucus a few weeks ago to vote for impeachment? So the issue on impeachment depends on what he's being brought up on. We cannot impeach right now over the any supposed Russia collusion or whatever. The investigation hasn't been finished. However, the Bank of China rents space in Trump Tower in New York City. That means the Chinese government is funneling money into the Trump organization. And because Donald Trump has broken with long-held tradition, remember Jimmy Carter sold his peanut farm to avoid any conflict of interest, he is in violation of the Emoluments Clause of the United States Constitution, or allegedly is, um, through which is foreign governments are putting money in his account uh, because of his business dealings and the fact that he hasn't divested himself from the Trump organization. So I believe on the Emoluments clause there is reason to bring up articles of impeachment it's not been tried before and to be tried in the Senate but I believe there's a, at least a prima facie case on its face to um, impeach the president on the emoluments clause okay um, a couple more sorry uh, do you support new progressive leadership for Democratic House leadership or do you support Nancy Pelosi as speaker of the House? I think a new House majority should come with uh, a new speaker of the House uh, so should uh, Speaker Pelosi, Leader Pelosi be re-elected, I think we should bring a new generation of leadership in. I think somebody like Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard, somebody like Congressman Keith Ellison would be excellent leaders for the new House majority. Okay. Um, 
do you support single payer health care? I support Medicare for all, um, both bills actually, HR 676 in the House and S1804 in the Senate. Um, there's things to like and pick and choose between the two of them, so I'd like to see us put together a joint House Senate bill that brings the strengths of both bills together but ultimately moves us through a Medicare for all system, which is what I believe is right for the United States. Um, if we look at the countries that have single payer, Canada, Australia, and to a certain extent the UK, though the UK actually goes further than single payer. Common law countries tend to do well with single payer systems. Civil law countries like France and Germany seem to do well with mandate systems. And I think we may have misconnected with the ACA when we filled out a mandate system instead of a single payer system. Okay, last question. Um, do you support legislation for stricter federal gun laws? Um, yes, I think we should, um, number one, have a background check for all sales of firearms. I think we should ban bump stocks, which is a commonly held thing. Uh, gun, gun owners support this. Even a majority of gun owners in New York State now support reinstating the ban on assault weapons. Um, so these are weapons that belong in the battlefield. They do not belong in our schools. They do not belong in our theaters or our nightclubs. Um, you know, there are other firearms available to do the jobs that the AR-15 does. We don't need that firearm. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you very much, sir. It was Thank nice you. talking to you. Be sure to talk to my press secretary, Paul. Okay. Okay. So, um, you can oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. My name is Grayson Fick. I'm a student Hi, at uh, South Glens Falls High School. Okay. Um, I'm doing a report for my politics class about, um, you know, local the local 21st district election. And I was wondering if I could actually ask you some questions sure. for my research project. And your name is Grayson. Yes. Okay. Um, who will you vote for in the New York Democrat gubernatorial primary? Uh, Nixon or Cuomo? I have I haven't decided that yet. Okay, next question. Do you believe President Trump should be impeached? Uh, I know a few weeks ago, 60 members of the Democrat caucus uh, voted in favor of impeaching the president. Do you support that, or are you... When I get to Congress, if there are impeachable offenses that have been discovered, then, yes, I would follow that path. Okay, just a couple more. Um, do you support new progressive leadership for Democratic House leadership, or do you support Nancy Pelosi for Speaker? I would like to reserve the specific answer to your question until after I'm in Congress. What I do support is whoever will be able to take our party back to what we really stand for, which is all people matter, 
everyone has the chance to realize their full potential and that hard work should be rewarded so that we can take our party forward. So that's who I would support. Okay. Do you support single payer health care? As I, I said briefly, we need to get there, yes. Medicare for all. At the same time though, and I think this is really important, we often forget, is that we need to bring down the costs of health care. And I know that a single payer would help bring down some costs, but those would be the administrative costs. We need to bring down the cost of health care and increase the outcome. So whatever we do, those have to be included. Okay. And lastly, do you support legislation for stricter federal gun laws? Oh, federal legislation, oh, there should be universal background checks, absolutely. Um, we should be reframing the Dickey Amendment so that it's clear that it can study gun violence. Okay, that's all. Thank you very Thank much, you so Emily. Thank you much for what you're doing. You're welcome. Thanks. Nice meeting you. Hi there. Uh, my name is Grayson Thick. I'm a student at South Glens Falls High School. I was wondering if I could ask you a couple questions. I know uh, he couldn't. I'm sorry, I forget the name. Uh, I know Mr. Radigan couldn't make it to the event, and I was wondering if I could ask you the questions instead. Or uh, I mean, I, I went up front. I can do the best I can, but okay. it's not the same as um, speaking so with him. Who does Mr. Radigan plan on voting for in the um, Democratic gubernatorial primary, Cuomo or Nixon? Not a, a, a topic that he has disclosed to me. Okay. Um, does he believe that President Trump should be impeached? I know a couple weeks ago, um, 60 or so members of the Democratic caucus voted in favor of impeaching him. I was wondering if he was in favor of that as well. Uh, it's also not his topic that he's discussed with me. Um, does he support new progressive leadership for Democratic House leadership, or does he support Nancy Pelosi for Speaker of the House? Uh, I think that he would say I mean, the campaign feels there needs to be a change in leadership. We need change. I mean, politics is broken, and it's a myriad of issues. It's not just one thing to pinpoint, but new leadership is something that would definitely help. Um, does he support single-payer health care? Uh, he supports health care for all, but I mean, he doesn't feel that he, as someone who's not an expert in health care, has the exact solution that we should enact. So okay. what the means is to make sure everyone has access to health care uh, isn't something that he's pinpointing on his own, but he does think everyone should have access to health care. And lastly, um, does he support sh uh, legislation for stricter federal gun laws? Uh, I mean, he had said that he's a supporter of the Second Amendment, but he does think that things need to change. What I mean, something that he has said before is that free-flowing semi-automatic weapons isn't something that's necessary in the country. He believes in the use of firearms for things like hunting. He himself owns a shotgun, but uh, to have things that are just uh, to the extent that we have them in the country now, things could probably change. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hi there, uh, Grayson Thick. I'm a student at South Glens Falls High School. Oh, awesome. um, in my politics class, we're doing a project where yeah. we're supposed to go to an event like this and you know interview some of the people who are speaking. I was wondering if I could ask you some questions. Of course. Thank you. It's um, awesome that you came. Are you, are you enjoying it? Or did you yeah. enjoy it? Oh, this was great. Hey, wait, sorry, one, one second. Yeah. Thanks for the help on that. Was it good? I, I, I tried to say what. Yeah, I think you know my impression overall was that. Well, I meant on the national security. No, no, what I'm saying is that is that uh, you know everybody else who has that issue on the screen. That was my. Yeah. I think some people. Was that the other one with the paper? Yes. 
Yeah, but I'm just saying I think it's the solution side of what I need to talk a bit more about. And part of the ball is in my court to be clear on you know some of the follow factors. It's very important stuff, and you could I mean you could have a whole forum on that issue. We could go down to region by region, which uh, climate-based disruption is leading to conflict. Basically, Syria yeah. was an interesting one to bring up. It was. I'm glad that this case example has got us on. So, you know, first thing is to sort of get the, the awareness. And that was the first thing the suggestion I made is if you guys can just keep, when this issue comes around, say, look. we got to amplify somebody. it. Yeah, that's right. And this is awesome. you because got all these it, people. we get to bring up all sorts of issues that would get law, it wouldn't get brought up if you had fewer candidates. But the, you know, the other piece of it, as I mentioned, Don, is that this is an issue. This is a cut into the climate issue that you can talk to people in the middle about. It. I've convinced guys in my barber shop repeatedly. They walk out saying, I agree with you. Yeah. And that's as red as it gets. It doesn't get any redder than my barber shop. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, so if I can do it there, it's because this issue allows you to reach to the middle. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I appreciate all your help. Thanks Good. so much. Thank you. You did a wonderful yeah. job. Okay. We cut in your time. I wanted to bank some time. I didn't. <laughs> Nobody was banking. Uh, Everybody was banking. Oh, no, that's fine. I was very concerned that it was going to be repetitive. Oh, no. And I really appreciate your kind of lifting everything. Thank you. 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 Thank